All right, KetoCon, and I am Dr. Dan Pompa. Boy, I'll tell you, we've had some uh, crazy times, but I'm glad I can still deliver this message for those of you who are keto fans. Look, uh, this talk is going to bless you, um, especially if you're a rock solid keto fan. Um, three people, three groups of people that this talk really is going to benefit. Number one, people that have been doing keto for a while and just want to take their results right to the next level. All right, you're going to learn a lot in this talk. Um, and those of you who have been doing keto and maybe stalled out and, you know, I just can't lose that last 10 pounds, whatever it is. All right, there's a reason for that. This lecture is absolutely for you. And those of you who just said, gosh, you know, I never really could get into ketosis. I never really fat adapted very well. All right, this talks for you. So uh, a lot of categories here. And I, I would even throw in another one. People with hormone difficulties, thyroid conditions, adrenal conditions, perimenopausal women. Uh, this talks for you. And, and some of which uh, that are out there that you've heard that you're a woman, don't do ketosis, right? Or don't fast or intermittent fast. All right. All those answers are coming up. So um, with that said, let's go to the first talk. I, I talk about this as being two biohacks um, for hormone optimization because every one of the topics that I just gave you, really, it's a hormone issue, right? The reason why people uh, can't lose weight, especially as they get older, is really it's a hormone problem and more so even what they're eating, believe it or not. So there's great reasons for this. And of course, I'm going to tell you how, what we're doing um, to optimize hormones. And I say we because I train doctors all around the world uh, about these things. Ketosis is a major tool uh, that we utilize to downregulate cellular inflammation and even implement my detox strategies, which I'm known for. So, you know, I don't know if you've followed me at all, but I am known for two things. It's my cellular detox and my fasting. So, and I, and I have been blessed to train many, many doctors around the world in these strategies and the public is like alike. So you are going to enjoy this and I promise you it will be information that you've never heard before. So let's dig right in. If you change the slide here, you know, I start with this. It's not genius, but courage that changes the heart. And no one's really clear on who said that, but I love it because that's my story. Uh, my story is a from pain to purpose. I always say I didn't really choose any of this information. Uh, somehow it chose me. But I, I have to tell this story. I was in Africa and I had just spoken at a big leadership conference in Zimbabwe, uh, probably way over my head. I had an interpreter, which was the first time I actually did that. But um, I was blessed nonetheless to be there. But when you speak with an interpreter, you kind of, you know, you're kind of talking like uh, this in and out, up and down. You just kind of don't know their pace and you're hoping it's getting translated correctly. Well, after the talk, one of the leaders of all of Zimbabwe, I would say it's, you know, at that time it was Mingabe and this man. And he came not running, but at a very brisk pace uh, as the talk ended towards the stage. And of course my heart dropped because I'm thinking I said something wrong. <laughs> it was interpreted wrong, honestly. Um, but he said to me something different that I didn't expect. He said, Dr. Pompa, I want you to know that your authority doesn't come from your years of education, years of knowledge. It comes from the authority or it comes from the victory that God gave you. And at that time, I really didn't understand fully. And it wasn't until later, you know, I went through a major illness. You know, it took me into everything that I teach now. And now I get it. It was the victory God gave me in the illness that really empowers me. So my authority does not come from my years of learning. My authority in all of these topics uh, comes from the victory God gave me. So, you know, the courage in the heart, the boldness that I have uh, really, really comes from that. So, all right, let's go to the um, really the first PowerPoint. And um, what no one wants to talk about in the world of keto, and I, I'll throw fasting and intermittent fasting into this loop as well. There's four problems uh, that can affect weight loss resistance or people in long-term low-carb diets like ketosis. Um, so that's, that's a problem that we hear about. Uh, muscle loss and fat storage 
which I call skinny fat, where you're losing muscle and gaining fat. And it happened to me, actually. I was down to about uh, five to 10 carbs a day and wondering why I was getting weaker in the gym and I was getting more belly fat, specifically right around the front of my belly. So of course, I did a lot of homework on that and I found some answers. You know, when you hear about, well, oh, ketosis, low carb diets can cause insulin resistance. Well, it does, but it's not the disease state. It does for a reason differently than you'd think, but it wants to hold on to its fat to save its life. That's the short answer. But the fact was, is many people get this skinny fat. And Joe Mercola, it happened to him. I was at a cancer um, seminar in Orlando, Florida. And he said, Dan, I have to ask you this. You know, this is when he was writing his book, um, uh, uh, Fat for Fuel. And he said, you know, I'm losing strength and, and I definitely am gaining body fat. So I must be losing muscle, but I'm gaining, getting fatter. I've done everything. And he went through the list. And if you know Joe, it's probably true. He did everything. He's like me. You know, and I said, oh, Joe, the answer is really easy. And he did what I told him to do. And sure enough, that solved his problem. Now, I'm not going to tell you what he did yet or what I did because it's part of the lecture. So, all right. So let's go back to that PowerPoint. Okay. So the other one, okay. And of course, uh, with long-term intermittent fasting or low carb, we have the, sa the same thing can occur. It's not just low carb diets like ketosis. Women's success in general um, on a low carb diet and fasting. Uh, you know, really, I mean, many women struggle, as I pointed out, right? Especially women with hormone challenges can struggle in ketosis more so than men and even fasting and fasting strategies. So uh, there's an answer. So it's not that women can't fast. It's not that women can't be in ketosis long term. It's not that women can't. There's an answer. So hormone issues such as thyroid and adrenals while in low carb diets or fasting can have major problems. I said that also. So what are the problems and what are the answers, I guess? I mean, so these are the problems. And, you know, let's look at the answers. Next PowerPoint. All right. So if we look at problem number one, during low carb, right, aka keto, uh, the body can try to preserve its precious fuel supply. So it will slow lipolysis, aka fat burning, by taking up more water in the fat cell. All right. So that can lead to that really dimply fat that you don't like, you know, that's on the spots that you hate right? That happened to me too, by the way. So it literally will slow down fat burning by putting water in the cells. Not a pretty look, I can assure you. So it will also blunt the insulin receptors to hold on to its precious fat. So you have to understand that the insulin resistance that, you know, people talk about, right, is a criticism for ketosis. Really, it's a survival mechanism. It's not like you're a diabetic and have insulin resistance, but from literally the DNA of the cell, the body will send a signal to the receptor to insulin, and I believe, you know, potentially other hormones, and it will stop or slow down fat metabolism. Why would it do that? Well, it's all for the sake of survival. So you have to understand, the cells can only use two things for energy, sugar or fat. And if you bring the camera back to me, I'm gonna make these little cells, and here we have sugar and fat are the only two sources, right? A fuel that the cell burns. So what happens when we switch over in a state of ketosis to where now the cell is burning mostly 95% fat is its energy source. Well, the body's not stupid. It says, wait a minute, I really need this fat to survive because this is what I'm being forced to burn. So guess what it does eventually? And genetically, it's a little different for everyone when this happens, but the body will eventually say, you know what? I have to slow down the burning of this just so there's a day that we don't have any food, right? So it goes into a little starvation mode. So one of the first things it does is it will just send a signal and blunt the insulin receptors. Insulin's a fat storing hormone and you start to hold on to your fat. So that's an issue, especially the deeper you get in it, then the body can preserve, like literally say, okay, well, I need to replace sugar in the, uh, in the liver stored as glycogen in case I have to run from a lion, right? Or fight for my life. So it will, burn the fat, but it will, it will store the fat and slow down fat metabolism, but it'll actually take the muscle um, and through gluconeogenesis and break down the sugar to restore that needed stored sugar for, to save its life. So you can lose muscle and gain belly fat all because the body wants to survive. And if you look at this PowerPoint here, you see the picture. 
that's just a great analogy, I think, because all right, imagine yourself out in the middle of the woods, right, in Alaska, and yeah, you have enough wood that you typically know will last you through a hard winter, right? Well, you have that normal wood, and here it is. It's been the worst, coldest winter on record, right? And you're burning through your wood pile. So it looks like the one on the right there, the depleted one, that one right there. So you're burning up your wood faster than normal. And then you realize, uh-oh, I'm going to run out of wood, right? AKA I'm burning my fat. Oh my gosh, what if I run out? What if I go through starvation? So you start slowing down the burning of the wood and burning less. So instead of being nice and 70 degrees in your cabin, now you're down to 55 degrees, just saying, okay, I got to survive, right? We're putting layers of clothes on. So, you know, you're burning less wood, AKA burning less fat, right? Okay. Now how the rest of the story goes is a, a, a friend comes along that you haven't seen in a while, just checking on you. And he sees your wood pile way down and he says, oh my gosh, you know what? I, I have so much, I'll dump off more to you. So then if you look at the picture there on the left, then he dumps off the wood and now you have that pile. <laughs> so are you going to burn more wood and bring the temperature up to 75 degrees? Of course you are, because you're going to say, I have plenty and you're going to ramp the metabolism right back up. That's exactly what your body does. So it will start burning more fat when it knows it has more. All right, hang on to that thought because it leads to the biohack. It leads to the biohack answer of what we need to do to get our bodies burning fat again when we've been low carb for a long time, or maybe doing a lot of intermittent fasting. All right, let's go to the next PowerPoint. Problem number two. So low insulin actually can increase glucose. Uh, I, I have to actually credit Joe Mercola for giving me this one because he was like, Dan, you're right, look. And he sent me this, <laughs> but there's others. But I like to tell that story. Um, understanding its action in health and disease, insulin. So what this article says basically is when um, low, your insulin gets low for too long or long periods, I should say, we actually can start to see an elevation of glucose climbing up. The body starts to go through gluconeogenesis. One of insulin's main jobs, basically, and that's what the paper says, is that it turns off gluconeogenesis. So if you're low insulin too long, you start to struggle to turn off gluconeogenesis, meaning you'll make glucose from other sources, AKA muscle. Um, but the point is, is it can even release it from the liver. So if an insulin starts to go down, and I've had many of these uh, clients and patients myself, we start to see the insulin starting to bump up. Ah, there's a solution for that. All right, third problem. So if you look at the next PowerPoint, all right. Hormone conversion actually needs insulin. Now, the example I gave here is um, T4 and T3. So thyroid hormones, we absolutely, and by the way, this is the same, this can happen with estrogen as well. So the, the, the theory is, well, people with thyroid problems and women um, due to estrogen should not fast or stay in low carb too long. Well, no, not necessarily true, but let's look at what happens and why they say it. So T4 is the inactive form um, of thyroid hormone that has to convert to T3, but it needs insulin to make this conversion. And when insulin gets low too long, people that typically already have low hormones, thyroid conditions, perimenopausal women, well, what happens is they really feel that effect. So um, what we know is that at a specific time of the month, ladies, we're gonna talk about that, and this does apply to men too, that when we push insulin back up, all of a sudden now we can get not just thyroid hormone converting better, but many hormones. So I'll let you in your mind start to think, hmm, what could, when could that time be? When should I do that? How long should I do that? All right, well, the answer's coming. All right, next PowerPoint. And as we now start into the answers to this biohack number one diet variation or what i like to call as part of diet variation feast famine cycling is it is a biohack a cellular biohack that breaks through those three problems uh, and there's another problem the second one is you're going to going to see uh, may surprise many of you um, but this is an answer there are weekly strategies which i'll explain further there are monthly strategies, which I tip my hand to, and there's even seasonally st seasonal strategies. So all of these, I can tell you that, you know, you read something in literature 
and you go, oh, wow, this, this makes sense. Like me discovering the, the, uh, how the uh, DNA turns down the uh, insulin receptor and you go, okay, but let's put some application to it. So I, I am blessed to have a group of doctors uh, that were able to try all of these strategies, the weekly, the monthly, and the seasonal, and put it to task at some of those conditions or myths that uh, we just went through, problems, whatever you want to call them. But look, let's go, I just wanted to show you that there's three, but let's go to the next slide because I break down weekly. Let me start here, actually. I, I did really want to give you an idea more of why this works. I, I think before I even give you the answer here of how to do weekly, monthly, and seasonal variation strategies, which you could start right away. I, you'll see just an, a major breakthrough with these strategies, with your, uh, whether you're a doctor watching this or just uh, someone in ketosis. Um, it, it's pretty remarkable. But this is why it works, because the adapt or die principle, the, the number one priority to the body is survival. That's it. You know, the innate intelligence that's in all of us just wants to survive above everything, right? Just if you ever wonder why the body is so smart, why would it create too much inflammation? And why would we have to ice, you know, at times? Because it really only cares for what's going on at that moment. Save your life, stabilize that joint, save your life. It doesn't think long term, which, you know, that's a problem oftentimes. That's why you can build up too much scar tissue, too much inflammation. So your body doesn't care about your belly fat or your hip fat or whatever it is. So it just wants to survive, right? So, you know, this principle utilizes that survival mechanism. So go back to the PowerPoint, major dietary shifts drive survival adaptation. Adaptation occurs due to hormone optimization. I'm going to read that again. The adaptation to survive, the body does this adaptation by optimizing your hormones. That's part of why this works. Next slide. All right, some of you can relate to this. You've heard a lot about like getting, moving in and out of cold temperatures, cold baths, showers, going from far infrared saunas, you know, back into a cold bath and how this can break through fat loss and even change your microbiome. Well, the study actually shows that cold temperatures may help you shed pounds. Why? Well, this particular answer, temperature changes force adaptation by altering the microbe causing a hormonal shift, hormone optimization. So the, the research, this was in Cell, by the way, a very prestigious magazine. There's a micro, one microbe in this case, but there's others, acromantia. And what it did is it, this one uh, bacteria is associated with obesity and diabetes. It virtually disappeared when we would stress the body in cold temperature, especially moving it in and out of the cold temperature. Now, if you've done these cold chambers, if you will, or ice baths. They talk about how it breaks through and you know, all of a sudden you start burning brown fat again. Well, the principle works like this. It raises up a hormone called norepinephrine. It's a life-saving hormone. The body raises it up in stressful situations. And then guess what follows it? Growth hormone. Guess what also happens? A downregulation of inflammation. So norepinephrine, inflammation, right? So you come out of these cold chambers, you feel amazing. Your hormones are optimized raising up growth hormone, raising up norepinephrine, downregulating inflammation, and your cells become more sensitive for a period of time to your, all your good hormones. So that's a hormone optimization. Why? Your body wanted to save its life. Now, this study is showing it even optimizes by adjusting certain bacteria in the gut. And it goes even beyond that. So to save its life, the bacteria get optimized. Right, and that's what that paper showing. All right, probably a better example is the next PowerPoint. At least many of you could, everyone can relate to this, right? So, have you ever done an um, exercise program in the beginning? Uh, if you haven't exercised in a while, and it, it's magic, right? I wasn't able to go to the gym um, for this Corona thing, right? So I was doing some home stuff, but my first day back the other day in the gym, it's like, I'm so sorry, even sitting here now, what, what I did so little would happen, right? My body was not used to it. So it, it, you know, it took very little to kick me into this adaptation mode, right? So the point I want to make is if you're doing the same routine all the time, it, your body doesn't even have to adapt anymore. It's so easy. So you're not getting a hormone optimization. So guess what happens? The results plateau. Everyone knows that, right? If you hire a good trainer, first thing they do is every week they're changing high intensity, low intensity, this exercise, that exercise. That's what good trainers do because most of us, most people, we go in the gym, we do, we just get 
used to the same thing over and over again. The worst thing you can do. So how do we get better results from our exercise? You change your routine, right? It's, there's nothing magical here. But look, if you look, go back to the barber boy, because if you look at this, well, why does this work when you change your routine? Well, it increases growth hormone. It increases, there's that norepinephrine, right? Same thing with the cold. It increases hormone sensitivity. sensitivity. Same thing with the cold. Uh, increase, there's an increase in luteinizing hormone, which is actually how you make testosterone. That's what T is. So there's an increase in mitochondrial function, right? So all of this, when you change your exercise routine, you're getting all of this hormone benefit. And it says right there, if exercise stays the same, the benefits plateau. So, and actually what study shows actually declines. You must vary your routine for continued results. And every good trainer knows that. All right, so next PowerPoint. What about diet? Is, does it play into the same? So does the body have to adapt to diet changes? The answer is yes. So if we switch our diet, the microbiome, just like in the cold, it has to adapt, it changes. So one of the things I always say is, look, my doctors will tell you this as well. We don't ever fix a gut by just giving people bacteria. It just doesn't work, right? But how do we do it? We do it with these same strategies I'm teaching you here. We're gonna force, I'm gonna show you how to do this weekly, monthly, and seasonal, but we force dietary changes to force adaptation. We get a hormone optimization, but we also get a microbiome optimization. Pretty cool, it works. Now I have to say this, that you know, yes, the metabolism adjusts, that's how we're able to break through weight loss resistance. You actually get rid of bad mitochondria. These are the guys that aren't burning fat efficiently, stuck as sugar burners, because the cells can only use sugar or fat. Well, we know in this process, we actually, the bad cells don't adapt, only the strong ones do. So we get rid of bad ones because they can't make the adaptation. The body will literally get rid of them. Boom, apoptosis, uh, autophagy, gone. Our DNA is programmed for these changes. And, and that's one of the things I, have, I really want to tell you is that we really are programmed for dietary changes. One of the big mistakes is staying on the same diet. But you know why we do it? We do it because it worked for us. We do it because, hey, I became a vegetarian and I felt so much better. Well, of course you did. But... According to a lot of studies, it's just because you changed your diet, but it also could have been because you got rid of some bad foods too in your diet, you know, so that forced change worked. But a year later, hmm, you have different symptoms and you don't think it's the diet because that worked for you, but just maybe it is, right? What about, I could go through the list of different diets, but the fact is, is when you look at and study ancient cultures, they were forced to change their diet based on environmental changes, droughts, seasonal changes, animal shifts, whatever it was, but the change we've realized now is magic for our hormones. So they were forced to make change. I think we need to be taught, right? So genes change for survival. We can turn bad genes off during big dietary shifts. I'm also, my book is called Beyond Fasting, and I talk about why I believe even one five-day fast a year will change your life significantly because of these reasons, because the body is forced into making all these changes in fasting times. We're genetically programmed for it. We actually turn off genes that stressors turn off through the year and we need to turn them off. I fast about four times a year and I'm also in and out of very low carb, which I call high carb, which is still low carb for, for many people. But those are the dietary changes that I do on purpose to optimize my hormones and I'm 55 this year. So I, gotta, I really have to optimize my hormones. But again, tribes were forced into these changes and optimize not knowing it, but we need to learn them. So go back to the PowerPoint and epigenetics, we can change and turn off these genes that do in fact get turned on, uh, on and off. So studies actually show it. So I believe we need these times. And of course the microbiome shift. Okay, so, oh, you switched uh, PowerPoints on me. Okay, so if you look at this slide here, diet change adaptation occurs, okay? Does this look familiar to you? I'm not even going to read it. Looks like exercise. Looks like cold change, right? So when you change your diet, yeah, you get a, actually a growth hormone rise right when you change it. Neuropinephrine, hormone sensitivity, luteinizer, all the same shifts happen just like exercise or cold. All right. So next PowerPoint. All right. So feast famine drives major adaptation in hormone optimization. Look, I don't need you to understand this fully but there is a point behind it. There are two major pathways at work here. Okay, so we have an autophagy pathway, 
which is when we're in low carb, uh, like keto, your body starts to literally get clean house to the point where it's a catabolic pathway. Too much of it can actually be detrimental. Fasting states, which I love fasting. My book is beyond fasting, but too much fasting um, or lack of calories or even too low of protein all can drive too much autophagy. If you're in this state too long, it doesn't work. You know, a great example of that is if it, there was called the Biosphere 2 Project where uh, I think it was seven people, uh, they, they were in this perfect biosphere and they had the perfect diet and they restricted calories around 30%. Why did they do that? Because studies showed that it extended life and downregulated inflammation, all these amazing things. And we did this in animals, let's do it in people. So the Biosphere 2 Project did just that. And for two years, they put these people in on this perfect diet, perfect environment, everything. They got worse. It was a fail. Uh, their organs shrank. Their immune systems lowered. And yeah, they actually stimulated, uh, they turned off some bad genes, turned on some good ones. But as a whole, they were in a weakened state. It didn't work. That was caloric restriction long term. They were in autophagy too much. But what we've learned is short periods, like five days, you know, whatever, three days, seven days, works amazing. We can turn off those same genes. We can hormonally optimize. We just can't go too long. Now let's flip to the other side. If you go back to the PowerPoint, that's called the mTOR pathway. Think of this as the bodybuilding pathway. Bodybuilders love this pathway, right? This is the feasting state, right? This is where we increase calories, increase carbs for periods of time, or increase protein. Any one of those will actually stimulate this pathway. Now, critics oftentimes criticize maybe ketosis, definitely paleo, and some other diets of, well, it stimulates mTOR, and mTOR ages you prematurely. Well, they're right, but it's no different than the autophagy pathway. Too long, and you'll actually shorten your life. You'll create inflammation, other problems, turn on bad genes. But when you do it in short bursts, we create magic. We create an anabolic pathway where the body goes, I'm going to heal that knee or whatever it is. So my point is this, think of it this way, famine stimulates the autophagy, right? Fasting and famine, high protein, high carbs. Again, we're talking short periods can be leveraged for short-term mTOR, which is an anabolic pathway, which can be healing. We need both ancient tribes. They got both benefits of both. All right. So that is the takeaway. This is why this works. All right. Now let's look at some details. Next slide. Okay. When and why would someone do this? All right. I kind of tell you, told you that, but let me be a little more specific. So you're not fat adapting, even in ketosis, right? Great time to do this. Not losing weight at all. Stop losing weight, losing weight, um, losing muscle weight, which is what we don't, which I already told you is skinny fat, gaining muscle, um, or I'm sorry, gain muscle and therefore weight. So meaning that if you want to gain muscle, and therefore weight. This is also a strategy. So people watching this say, well, I can't gain weight. Well, guess what? This is a strategy as well. Uh, no energy in ketosis. You never just seem like you feel yourself. This strategy is for you. Hormone conditions, especially thyroid. Okay, the how-to. Let's go do it. Let's look at weekly strategies. All right, I love this. In my book, Beyond Fasting, um, we have chapters four and five. I dedicated to this principle that I call feast famine cycling. And this weekly variation fits into that. So here's the feast, here's the famine. So mTOR, right? That's the feast. Autophagy is the fast, right? So we have five days of ketosis. Every one of you easily can do that. I'm sure watching this. And then we have one random day of the week where we just eat one meal or no meal. So put it together. That's the fast. Yeah, you got that. And then one random day of feasting. So what does that day look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. Uh, you want to get, let's say you choose to do a high carb day. That's my Saturdays typically. So that would look like about mm, 100 to 150, depending on body size, depending on who you are, even up to 200 grams of carbs a day. Okay, that's a day. That's a feast. Or let's say you want to mix it up because remember, not just elevated carbs can stimulate this mTOR pathway, this anabolic pathway, but increased protein. Well, how much do I do? Well, you can do what a bodybuilder does. One pound um, of lean body weight to one gram of uh, protein. That's a lot of protein. Bodybuilders do that. Why? To stimulate mTOR, to gain muscle. 
Well, I'm not telling you to do it long term because that would be damaging. What I'm telling you to do one day a week of that. Okay. And by the way, some of you may absolutely do that more days. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But also that feast day can also just be day where maybe you eat three or four meals that day. So, because that would be an increase in calories. So a feast can be increased calories, increased protein or increased carbs, all of which stimulates mTOR. Makes sense, right? All right. So, and then we can, the, let, let me just say this too. The feast is far more important, perhaps for some of you, than the famine as important as the famine is, because we think of the famine as the exercise. We want to stress the cell. A fast is a stress. So when we go 23, 24 hours without food, we are in an autophagy state. So what happens in that fasting state? The body stimulates something called autophagy, which means the body will feed to get energy from the bad cells. It'll get rid of the bad cells, the rubbish, even the bad pathogens, bacteria, very important. Right? But we learned that if you do that all the time, it's a catabolic state and it actually works against you. But a few days of this is actually incredible to renew your body because here's what it does. When it gets rid of a bad cell in this autophagy state, it stimulates a stem cell and it recreates a brand new cell. It's better, not malfunctioning. And a great example of that is when I taught fasting in the 90s and I was into it all the way back then, believe it or not, when it was... You know, I was me and some natural hygiene society geeks and we didn't agree on eating meat or uh, I, I was the meat eater, right? And they weren't. So we, we just agreed on fasting. By the way, every religious group in the world disagrees on everything, even prayer, except fasting. But the, the fact was, is that um, uh, in the, the fasting state, the body gets rid of these bad cells, stimulates a stem cell. So the point I want to make is this. So they would notice in a fasting state that we had this large drop in white blood cells. In the 90s, we didn't know why that was. We would just say, well, look, all we know is by some periodic fasts, we can downregulate autoimmune or like food sensitivities or any hyperimmunity, right? Allergies. And then we get an upregulation, especially a month after a fast where we get this better immune system. Well, we didn't know this now, but what was happening is the autophagy. The body was getting rid of only the bad immune cells, the hyperactive ones that were driving inflammation, autoimmune, but it was stimulating a stem cell and it was making new immune cells that weren't in this hyper mode. And these guys were vigilant, right? They were actually doing the job they should do. And that explained the better immune system later. So you get rid of a cell, yes, in a fasting state, but you stimulate a stem cell, create a new one. Now, that could be a, fa a cell that burns fat better, right? With better mitochondria. It's called mitophagy. Um, because in fasting states, the body also eats the bad mitochondria, right? So in a fasting state, it's like exercise. It's a stress that makes you better, your mitochondria better, your bio microbiome better. Remember that. But too much of it is not good. You know, I find that I have people in two camps. People that I have to remind them to feast, that they just be fasting worked and they want to do more of it. And I'm like, no, 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 it's, it could work against you. And the other side, that feasting, they have no problem. <laughs> it's getting them to fast. I have to remind them that this can cause gut, uh, gluttony and other problems. So it's the magic is the balance. So go back to the PowerPoint. The, uh, the 511 just kind of gives you that balance. Um, so yeah, go back to the PowerPoint, my guy. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, 421 is another example. So we have four days of keto, and then you can do two days of fasting. Again, you know, some of you might do better. I do two or three days like that of just eating one meal. Um, but again, some of you may do better with two days of feasting. If you have a thyroid condition, a hormone challenge, right? If you are in perimenopause, I'm gonna say in most women, do better with two days of feasting instead of two days of famine. But again, everyone's a little different. You can play with it. So I also could, you could do what I call a three, two, two, you know, which is you have two days of feasting, two days of fasting and three days of keto. The weekly variation reminds the body it's not starving. Very important, right? It reminds that, hey, don't shut off that insulin receptor so I store more fat. We have plenty. That one meal, that one feast a week reminds the body it's okay, you're not starving. And then two days after that, you start to see 
your ketones rise up. Now, don't even measure your ketones the day of or the day after, they're gonna be lower. But then two days after you see this high. So let's say you're only getting to 0.8, right, on your ketones. All of a sudden, boom, you'll see like 1.5 two days after and then for consecutive days. Why? Because the body was like, okay, we have plenty of wood, right? Let's start burning it again. That was my Alaska example. And it starts firing up the fat burning machine and lo and behold, boom. You know, I had a, the opportunity of um, interviewing Karen Verde, um, Kristen, I'm sorry, Kristen Verde. And, and they were talking about the, to break through, especially weight loss resistance, the diet that worked better than high fat, low fat, high, and they looked at them all, was a diet that was feast, famine, feast, famine. They were putting people on 500 calories and then high carb. Standard American diet actually is what they were doing. And then 500 calories, standard American diet. It worked better than any diet. So I asked the obvious question, why Kristen? And she said, it forces the body, it forces an adaptation. And most likely it's altering the hormones and the microbiome, exactly what I just showed you. So we need the variation. Keto is amazing, but if you want to go deeper into keto, you know, especially if you're hormonally challenged, you may need more than one feast day. And again, the feast days are as important as the fast days, but we need the fast days because caloric, when we just decrease carbs alone, it's not good enough. Uh, you know, because what it happens is when you're pushing where you're not eating at all, you're getting that a deeper autophagy where the body's getting rid of those bad cells. So it's not just lowering carbs. We need to exercise harder. I call it mitochondrial meta or me metabolic mitochondrial fitness, where without food, we're stressing the mitochondria, making them be better fat burners. We can do that better with no food than we can with low carb, right? But together, it's magic. So feast famine, 511-421-322, whatever you desire. Okay, next slide. Monthly. Okay, I led you into this, ladies. Um, I said, look, you know, hormones are the key here for success in ketosis, fasting, intermittent fasting, whatever you're doing. Um, and this is the key to hormone health for most of you. So you t we take five days a month typically. And we do this right before a woman's cycle. Why? Okay, so we do, when I say we take five days a month and we do what? We do high carb before. Now, this could be high protein as well. Both work. Mm, carbs work for most people better. But those of you who are more carb resistant, you could try protein. It also can work. But we take the five days right before the cycle. Why? Because that is where so much hormone conversion takes place. So the body's getting hormonally ready, all these adjustments, it needs, remember why this works? And remember the problem, it needs insulin. I showed you the study. It needs insulin to make the hormone conversions. So I use thyroid as the example. T4 is inactive and it goes to T3. Well, we need insulin to make that. So raising up carbohydrates before the, the period. And by the way, ladies, think of this. When you get your most cravings the week before your period. Oh, and by the way, you would probably consider that a failure. Oh, I just give in. I break the diet. I eat chocolate. Oh my gosh. I, your body's surviving. It knows exactly what it needs to do. It's giving you those cravings. Now I'm not saying break into them with a dish of ice cream. I'm saying break into that with more sweet potatoes, more yams, more fruit, more berries, right? Maybe some quinoa. If you do okay with grains, this is the time. So the point is, is that we push up the glucose that pushes up insulin and we now start converting hormones. So you come out of ketosis for that five days, which what happens hormonally the rest of the month. It is magic. You hormonally optimize, go figure. Men, if you have wives, do it at the same time your wife does it because somehow you're in hormonal sync. Trust me on this, girlfriends, boyfriends, if you're just completely single, just pick random five days, throw your body into a loop. Now I'll take it a step further and we do. We take five days where we do that high carb or high protein, choose another random five days of the month in fast. And that's what my book's about, how to do a five day fast. And again, it's beyond fasting. We could put the link, but if you go to beyondfastingbook.com, you can get it. But we, we talk about how we'll take five days in feast and five days of famine. And the five days of famine can even be reduced calories under a thousand. And in the book, I talk about how to do that, or it could just be water. 
But this feast famine cycling monthly, along with those weekly variations I was talking about, I'm telling you, it is magic. And all we're doing is tapping into what our DNA is actually set up to do. But I believe we're all meant to fast. And some people, I, you know, every month we mix up the fast, partial fast, maybe a couple of those every once in a while water fast, maybe it's a bone broth fast. But again, I fast four times a year. Some people, one time a year, it's still going to transform you. But the feast time is as important as the fast time. All right, next PowerPoint. Seasonal variation is a must. So I just used this study. Um, I have several, but the last half century has brought stark changes in lifestyle that depart from normal diurnal cycling and periodic fluctuations in food availability. Meaning there was times with, with food, without food, you know, winter time, different than summertime, right? I mean, all kinds of things, as I already explained. Thus, modern times may be characterized by being constantly in a feast environment. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's, that's most people in a modern country. The cellular consequences may be an increase in the risk of several diseases, including cancer. I took that right out of the abstract. So we know that seasonal variations are magic. I will take a month out of ketosis. And man, when I get back in, I'm telling you, it's absolutely incredible. Let me use my wife as a great example. So she got into ketosis and being in perimenopause, she struggled. She struggled in this and she was just, I mean, she'd be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, back down to 0 0.3, 0 0.5, lower carbs, lower carbs, feeling worse, less energy. Finally, after three months, I said, okay, she wasn't, she wasn't adapting. Well, let's just go back to a healthy low, car low carb. It was still low carb. I call it my cellular healing diet, um, but it was still much higher carb uh, than uh, obviously than she was when she was trying to get into ketosis. So she did that for two or three months. I moved her back into ketosis. Lo and behold, her numbers were much higher the second time. So I decided to do it again. Moved her back into a healthy, higher carbohydrate diet. Two months later, back into ketosis, even better. So then I put it to practice with my doctors. Let's try this. Let's move people that are more resistant in and out of ketotic states. And let's see if it worked. It did. And then, of course, the, the weekly variation, the monthly variations, all of it together in any fashion that works for your schedule. You know, there's no magic around it. I mean, again, I dedicated chapters three and four in my book uh, to this very principle and, you know, how to's and how, how to do it. All right. Next PowerPoint may be the most important um, as we look at who it's right for. Oh, I, you know, I kind of like this is still on the seasonal uh, part of this, right? Who is right is what I say, right? Everyone lines up in their camps, but there's an argument that a time on a carnivore diet um, is absolutely healing and a time on a super, super carb diet. Have you heard of that one? That's actually a new diet. Um, you know, you can make an argument for those, but the point is, is the magic is moving in and out of them. You know, and how much time you spend in one diet, you know, I, play, I spend more time probably in the lower carb things. That's me. Um, my wife can do a little higher carb, but you know, I, I think that the, the magic is in the variation, not the diet. But anyways, next PowerPoint. Um, and then this is a tribe I actually I spoke to you about. This tribe just had recently, um, uh, this was, I think this was from back in 2005 or six. Uh, they had recently come out of the mountains from a drought. And when they came out, they didn't have those clothes. <laughs> they actually got that from World Vision, who was in that area. And it was a shame too, because World Vision was trying to, of course, feed them. And the good thing about this tribe, which made them very unique, is they refused. Uh, they were a hunting gathering tribe. And so the men, when I was there, there was no men. You don't even see them in the picture. It was just kids and, and uh, older women. Uh, they were out hunting. They would leave early in the morning and they would come back later in the afternoon. They didn't eat all day. And nor did the women who were hunting, gathering, taking care of the kids. And they kind of ate as a culture for three hours. Pretty unique Interfa intermittent fasting uh, w eating window there. Um, they basically ate one long meal, very typical uh, to like the Italians that they did in the day, one long meal in the afternoon and espresso during the day. But the bottom line was, is I was able to see uh, a tribe that really was forced into times of drought and they, their health was extraordinary. One of the guys that brought me there said, Dr. Bob, I have to ask you this question. This tribe barely eats is what they, they thought they barely ate because they weren't taking the food. He says, but they have no disease to speak of. Uh, they don't even have words 
for the diseases that even the other tribes have. And I says, yes, by all means, don't force them to eat this food. Let them do their thing. Now, I don't know where that was since 2005. I was back there three times and they were still living their way, um, but not sure where they are today. I really have to check up on them. All right, next PowerPoint. And um, this is a big problem. So many of you. Okay, Dr. Bamba, I read your book. I did this. I still am having struggling to lose this 10 pounds or this 20 pounds. And I still don't feel good when I'm even in the lowest uh, carb state, you know, in the depths of ketosis. How come I'm not reacting like other people? Cellular toxicity affects hormones massively and therefore fat adaptation and therefore your success with a low carb diet, fasting, weight loss or gain, all of it. So the big second biohack is cellular detox. Now, I'm gonna move over here to my board and I've drawn this many times, but it gets the point across and I want you to understand. Now, I wish I had time, um, perhaps at another time with, for KetoCon, I would love to expand on this um, principle of what I call cellular detox. Want me to give you a little angle there? There you go, all right, beautiful. I draw a lot of cells in my day. That's a cell. On every cell, you have hormone receptors, right? So remember I said how T4, thyroid hormone, has to convert to T3, right? Inactive. The sad part here is this is mostly what doctors give people, right? I can't lose weight, doc. I have low energy, doc, right? It's like, oh, okay, you know, mm, yeah, we checked your thyroid numbers. Yeah, they look fine. They look fine. Oh, after 10 years, maybe 20, oh, it's low. Your TSH is low, right? That's the one that they typically go by, um, or it would be high one, one way or the other. So the fact is, is the TSH is high. You actually have low thyroid if it's low, you have high th uh, hyperthyroid. But the bottom line is they look at that one number and finally go, oh yeah, you have a thyroid problem. Or maybe they look at these numbers, right? All deceiving, by the way, because T4 has to convert to the active form T3. Now T3 has to connect with this receptor and get its message in the cell to the DNA where it says, okay, let's burn fat or into the mitochondria where it then burns fat for energy, right? So all of that has to take place by T4. Yeah, do we need that over here? I can move the board over here. Why don't I do that? Yeah, yeah let me get, because the sound I think was uh, dropping a little bit there. So I'll just do this, come in here. Good. Better sound, better sound. All right. So I hope they heard me because this was the sound good. Okay, good. All right. So the, the bottom line is, is the active form. Yes, it has to convert. By the way, much of that happens in the liver. So if you have a toxic body, you typically have a toxic liver and therefore you struggle to make that conversion. Matter of fact, selenium has a lot to do with that conversion, which things like mercury, they bind to selenium. It's a mercury magnet. So something like mercury can bind up that and create a loss of conversion. I talked about insulin being too low, which affects that conversion, right? So a lot of things affect that conversion. And the, the problem is with that is the TSH um, is off and maybe your T4, they start giving you the hormone, your blood work looks better. But the problem is, is you're not making enough of the conversion and they're not giving you T3. So although they gave you uh, T4 hormone, your blood work looks better. Your TSH, the gold standard looks better but you don't feel better because it didn't convert. But on the, on the other hand, let's say that you do convert or maybe the doctor is smart enough to give you a little T3 and T4. But the problem is, is when these re receptors are blunted, it doesn't get its message in the cell. So you still can't use fat for energy. So you don't, still don't feel well, you still have brain fog, you still have dry hair, dry skin, all of which thyroid hormone plays a role in. Well then, I hope you're asking the question, what caused that inflammation? Well, toxins is the number one cause of inflammation. Now, these are toxins that you could have accumulated from the time in utero, like heavy metals. Number one cause of lead toxicity is actually mom. It happened to my kids. They got it from their mother and it affected them years later, right? Well, mercury, ladies, the number of these silver fillings you have, according to the DRASH study, is proportional to how much mercury you have in your brain. Because, or I'm sorry, it's proportional to how much mercury the children have that you pass on to the children in utero. That's the DRASH study. 
But there is a study showing the number of fillings we have in our mouth is proportional to how much we find in our pituitary, which runs our thyroid and our adrenals and our hormones, right? That's the control tower, if you will. But the DRAS study showed moms, your fillings are proportional to how much we find in the baby's body and brain. So not good. So that's where a lot of these toxins are coming from is growing up. And then what about all the vaccinations? What about moldy homes? What about when you get wisdom teeth removed and it heals over and then what we have is left as a cavitation that has certain infections that drive cellular inflammation. Bottom line is this, toxins are the number one driver of the cellular inflammation. When these receptors to your hormones, by the way, it could be insulin, which is a fat storing hormone. It could be leptin, which is a hormone that controls appetite, failure on a diet, you name it, right? And fat burning as well. It could be um, a hormone like testosterone. It could be estrogen. The bottom line is all of these hormones have to attach to receptors and then get their message in the cell, many of which communicate to the mitochondria and are involved in how you burn or not fat for energy. So you can see, you can put yourself in a state of ketosis. Your mitochondria are just struggling still to burn fat and make ketones, right? Because when you burn fat, your body cells have fat for energy. You make some ketones, your brain loves them. You feel amazing, but yet you can't just seem to lose that last 10 pounds because you're still not efficient enough here. And it could be because toxins have blocked these receptors. They drive inflammation more technically. And then the inflammation really is creating a hormone resistance, right? So very classic that toxins affect us so many ways uh, with not success in fasting or low carb. So again, they can affect the conversion, they can affect the membrane. And I mentioned this a little bit already. What I'm drawing here is a human. Okay, believe it or not, that's a person. Okay, here's where I want you to focus though, the brain. Many of these toxins end up in the brain, and particularly right in the center, and it is called the pituitary hypothalamus, and that is your hormonal control center. So the hypothalamus takes information in from the body. How much T4 do we have? How much T3, right? Oh, okay, we need more? And then it stimulates the thyroid, which sits about here. It tells the thyroid, produce more, right? Because we need more. But it's producing more TSH. So you get this high TSH level. Produce more, produce more, but yet it doesn't matter because you can't get the message in the cell anyway even though it's trying to drive up these hormones or it's producing it and it's not converting. So it keeps raising the T TSH to try to fix the problem, not good. So toxins can affect directly the brain in the control tower of your hormones. Remember, the hypothalamus will tell the pituitary what to release and that's called thyroid stimulating hormone, right? And then it tells it to stimulate more hormone, right? So all of that can be a problem. And then the second place here, you can have certain toxins and I use mercury before, HG is mercury by the way, that actually have an affinity for these receptors. And then when you have the mercury, which is HG, combined to a receptor on the thyroid or on the cell, what happens is then this complex, the body sees that is foreign and it says attack. Well, then you might be diagnosed with Hashimoto's, right? Very common. And you know what's sad? Most people, most doctors aren't even running the blood work for autoimmune thyroid. You know why they don't? Their treatment's the same. They'll give you T4. Doesn't matter what caused it in their mind, but ultimately what is driving most autoimmune? It's toxins, right? I'm just using thyroid as the example, but remember one autoimmune presents into many autoimmune and we don't even have names for them now. But most people are in a state of autoimmune where their body's literally driving this inflammatory state. And yet everybody, even alternative doctors, they're way too downstream. Oh, take this natural thyroid, take this, take that. But ultimately, unless we detox the cell, you will never get well. And my saying is you have to fix the cell to get well, but more specifically, you have to detox the cell. So look, I, I've done a lot on this, right? I have what is my known as my five R's. And my five R's is a roadmap of how we fix the cell and get the cell doing what it should be doing day in, day out. And that's detoxing. When I was sick, my detox pathways were just shut down. And I did colon cleanses, I did Corella, I did, you name it, right? All the things that most of us know about, right? Saunas, 
And not that any of them are bad, honestly, but the fact is, is I didn't get my life back by any of them. Once I upregulated the cell function, that's what got my life back. That's when my hormones started coming back. So cellular detox is critical uh, from pain to purpose. I started this very talk by saying that. You know, everything I teach today came out of that. My authority, the gentleman was right. My authority absolutely came you know, from the victory God gave me. I discovered these pathways that need upregulate, and that's what my five R's are. Right? R number one is you have to remove sources, right? I had to remove these toxic fillings that were vaporizing mercury right into my brain. Um, and then the problem was I had to get it out of my cells and particularly my brain. You know, it was most of it was up in my pituitary and that's why hormonally I was a mess. Um, and R number two is regenerating the cell membrane, the outer membrane and these mitochondrial membrane. I do lectures on this. I mean, literally two hour lectures uh, a day I could teach on how the membranes are critical. Uh, there's something called membrane potential that your cells should be negative 70 to 80. And that is when you have energy and healthy people. When you get down to 50, you start seeing disease processes. When you get down to 15 or 20, you're talking cancer. So your membrane sets that potential of energy. And that's how your cell works. You can't detox a cell without a normal membrane potential. And yet, how many people really are getting it? We have to remove the toxins from the cell to create that new potential, however, a normal potential. But we also, I have many strategies that I teach on how we fix that membrane. R3 is or restoring the cell energy, which a lot of this strategy that I just taught you is part of how we do that. The feast famine cycling, uh, fasting states, feasting states, it really does make an impact there. Um, and as well as you know, some other strategies that I teach. R4 is reducing the cell inflammation. Uh, nothing like ketosis uh, for doing that. When we take, when we change with a fuel the cell uses to, from sugar burners, which most Americans I can speak to um, are stuck as sugar burners, and we switch it over to fat, fat adaptation and ketosis, now we can downregulate the inflammation of the cell. You know why? Because think about it this way. Think about wood in your fireplace. That is, that's glucose. Burns a lot of smoke. If you don't have the damper open, smoke pours in your house, you'll die. The flames won't kill you, the smoke will. Well, you know, that is exactly what happens when we're burning sugar in our ATP. There's a lot of smoke. And if your detox pathways are good, the cell gets rid of it, no problem. But if these membranes and pathways that detox cell are, are low and shut down, then you build up smoke in your cell just from the energy you make to live and survive. So therefore, if we can shift over to fat, which burns cleaner, now think of fat as burning clean in ketones, like natural gas on your stove. There's no smoke. So when we switch the energy of the cell, fat adapt, we can downregulate at least the inflammation and at least spare the detox pathways. Why? How? We spare them because now we're burning a cleaner fuel, the natural gas on the stove, and now we can utilize those pathways to get rid of the toxins that are by accumulated in your tissues, right? So it's a, it's a, ketosis is a very, it's always step one, you know, to what we do to detox the cell and down regulate the inflammation. R5 is reestablishing methylation. And methylation parallels glutathione. These are two pathways in the cell that you need to get rid of toxins day in, day out. And when they're impeded, it, the, the toxins build up the cell energy drops, the lower the cell energy, the more toxins, the more inflammation. It's just this perpetual cycle of inflammation. That's when you feel like crap. You've changed your diet. You still don't feel well. You can't lose weight anymore. Hormonally, you're not good. You can't sleep at night. Anxiety builds up because you're throwing up cortisol to get glucose up in the middle of the night. Why does that happen? Because you can't even use fat during the night and your body literally raises cortisol to save its life because it needs sugar in the brain. Bad, bad feeling. Anxiety happened to me. Anxiety at night wiped out during the day, right? So all of that is a cellular issue. If you don't fix the cell, you're not going to get well. And that really is the final portion of that message. And, and again, I taught you diet variation strategies. I taught you um, fasting strategies, how to do it. But Look, the detox, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm sure they'll provide you with my website. It's, yeah, yeah, I have a great webinar at pompauniversity.com. 
watch the webinar. It's great. I talk all about that, build on the concepts, uh, and even a test you can take uh, to look at your uh, cellular inflammation. So, all right, KetoCon, thank you for having me. And I know this will be a blessing to so many. So spread the word, KetoCon.